Do you wonder if others are dealing with the same project management challenges as you? Not sure where to turn for guidance and leadership? Office Hours are in session as we discuss project management and PMOs with global leaders, hearing their story and learning their secrets to success. Our goal is to empower you and help you elevate your PMO and project management career to new heights. Welcome back to Project Management Office Hours with your host, PMO Joe. Welcome, everybody. How do you like that new intro? I love it. Gets this show going, motivated, and I'm super excited to have that. Thank you to the Phoenix Business Radio X studio owner, Karen Nowicki, for that. And we're broadcasting to you live from Tempe, Arizona. Just want to, before we get into our show today with our special guest, Chris Kopp, want to mention that the 2020 Global PMO Leadership Survey is now live. This has been a work in progress for the past six months or so from the PMO squad. The survey runs through August 15th, and thus far, we've had some great response around the globe. We've had responses come in from Australia, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Greece, Hong Kong, Kenya, India, Ireland, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Spain, Thailand, Trinidad, the UAE, uh, United States, and Venezuela. So uh, great feedback so far from the global PMO community. Thank you for that. And for those who haven't participated yet and are interested in doing so, go out to the PMO Squad website. Uh, There's a link in the menu for the uh, survey. Go out there, please participate. And it's about 15 minutes or so to complete the survey, so we appreciate everybody's input. I mentioned the PMO Squad. They are our sponsor, so thank you to the PMO Squad, uh, the home of the Purpose Driven PMO. Visit www.thepmosquad.com to learn how the squad can support your project management team with veteran project management resources, project management training, and of course, PMO builds and improvements. Also a reminder to everyone to visit projectmanagementofficehours.com to see a list of our upcoming episodes and listen to all of our previous episodes. And I'm super excited. We are actually booked for the remainder of the year. How awesome is that, that we are in July and we have all our guests booked out That's an inclusion of both uh, U.S.-based and international guests. We'll have our first guest coming on from India in a couple of episodes, so I'm really excited about that. And then, you know, yesterday I got called out uh, in an email, and it was appropriate. Um, Someone had asked why we didn't have any minority guests on upcoming shows, and I had just talked about this topic with Jesse Fuel in a prior episode. Uh, and they're right. We have had some black guests in the past, both men and women, but in the remainder of the year, we don't have any guests lined up. So uh, acknowledged on my part, there was, there was no intent behind that, but we will make an intentful decision to include more black PMO leaders next year to ensure that we're giving uh, a good diverse background and voice to the community. So thank you for I won't mention who sent me that email, but thank you for the email. It was on point and uh, it is much appreciated. So thank you for that. So let's dig into our show. Super excited to have with me today, Chris Kopp joining me from Atlanta. Chris is a longtime friend. So welcome, Chris. Great to be here. I've been looking forward to this for many weeks now, Joe. Tell everybody a little bit about you. Uh, Who is Chris Kopp? What do you do? And uh, what's... What's going on with you? What I do is I am uh, currently the director of store technology implementation at Genuine Parts Company, um, the uh, Napa side of things. So uh, what what uh, the team does is I, I, I liken us to uh, a UPS truck, right? So we back up to the dock and whenever there's a new technology or new program or new application that needs to be delivered to the uh, Napa network, uh, my team will load up the you know, the software and the training and the change management and any hardware that's necessary. And then we'll, we'll get that out on the road there. So i um, been doing that for about six years now. And that's really kind of goes back to how you and I met, you know, many years ago there. Yeah. Sounds like you have a lot of Napa know-how. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so th- t- we met at Napa, uh, as you mentioned, about six years ago. Yeah. And uh, I was, it was actually the first contract that the PMO squad ever won. 
uh, as I branched out from corporate America and started the PMO squad was with Genuine Parts Company. Uh, I think I was there for about a year or so, and they brought you in as a permanent employee to replace me, so, uh, the contractor. So tell everybody about that story. Yeah. So, so that was, that's exactly right. They, they, they brought me in to, to replace you is what uh, <laughs> happened there. But I've got to say that was a fantastic experience. You know I mean? I reflect back on it. That was a great start because you and I had, what was it like a three week transition time, right? Yeah. So, you know, we were able to sit down, you were able to tell me all these things that have been going on and where things stood. And, you know, you took me to the various meetings, you introduced me to all the different people that were part of this process. And that transition was fantastic. So, um, you know, I just, I look back with fond memories on that was a great start to, to, to my career at Napa. And, uh, you know, I attribute a lot of that to you. So I'm very grateful to you for that. Yeah, well, my pleasure. And uh, I, just for those listening, I wasn't gone from GPC. They kept our company, the PMO squad around for four more years. We were there for long-term contracts, but it was great for them as we do with all our clients. If there's an opportunity to bring in a permanent resource and it makes sense, of course, we support that. Obviously your long-term success now at Napa obviously is related to the beginning transition you had. So I'm glad to be a part of that. Clearly, there's there's no doubt about that. <laughs> uh, and what really the fun part about that is so often in business, when one person replaces another, there's animosity, right? Yeah. But in this situation, there wasn't. And really, it was a, an appreciation was formed because you brought a lot of the skills uh, that really aren't in my bag uh, at that time, right? You have a uh, a different approach, a more creative uh, mindset than I do. And, and it really helped me also understand how we can make some changes with the PMO squad and move forward. So it really started a friendship that we've had for the past six plus years now. And I think that friendship really led to you being a guest, not just because you're my friend, but you had posted something out on LinkedIn, as you yeah. frequently do. Uh, share everybody kind of the the story behind that one. So I, I, I try, as a rule of thumb, I try and post at least two um, original articles per month on, on LinkedIn, right? So just to, just, I, I like the writing aspect and I like just taking notes and I like understanding how business works. So I just, you know, post these on LinkedIn and, uh, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's good to just keep connected with everybody that way. So the, one of these that I did back, I don't know, it was probably March or so. It was entitled um, Lessons Learned During a Chicken Dinner. And so the premise of this article was, is that, you know, I'm sitting in the audience at a PMI event and there's a fellow up on the stage that's talking project management, right? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, who doesn't know that? You know, and I take another bite of my chicken, right? And he's going on, he's talking more and I'm like, duh, you know, and I'm elbowing the guy next to me. It's like, isn't that obvious? So I'm just, you know, just trashing this guy up there. And then it occurred to me, I said, well, wait a second, here I am. I'm, I'm in the audience sitting at this table, listening to this guy that's up there talking to hundreds of people. So, so he had the courage to get up out of the audience and get onto the stage. And I had the courage to, to buy a ticket to this PMI event and eat this chicken dinner and get another biscuit. So it was like, Something's got to, you know, something's got to change there, right? You just, you got to get out of this comfort zone. And here it was a matter of that guy was on the stage and he was an expert because he was on the stage and he just put himself up on the stage. So that was the premise of the article. So then you called me out on this article. <laughs> your, your, your comment there was, and I, I quote, how about you join project management office hours as my guest and get on stage for a bit three question marks. And so I was like, oh man, that's not what I intended, but yep. I'm very, I'm very glad it worked out. I'm very glad to be here. Yeah. And, and the reality is I'm on this show because Karen asked me that question, right? In an indirect way, she said, well, why aren't you hosting your own show? And I, I was just a project management guy that would attend PMI events and occasionally speak at one, but you know, I'm, I'm not going to host a show. Right. Uh, you but then I had the courage to put the fork down, step away from the chicken dinner, come <laughs> on here. And now, right, we've, we've had leaders from all over the world, and it's been fantastic. And what are you, number one live 
project management show in the U.S., right? Yeah. I mean, how crazy is that? That is crazy. Yeah. And, and it's, it, the reality is it's the same thought process that you had about, you know, the, what you came to with your chicken dinner. And, and, and you have done a, a lot of those articles and, and a bunch of creative things in the project management space for a long time, going back to with Jennifer Bridges and, and others. Uh, and Jennifer reached out to me today with an email. So hopefully I've got something in the works coming up with her. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Uh, about yeah. So, so reading your stuff makes me think, right? I love that. Uh, you know, it's kind of there. You another had another one a story about a farmer looking to hire someone, right? What was that one about? So this this was a lesson I learned many years ago, and this this story just stuck with me, right? So there's a farmer that is, um, you know, he's looking to hire somebody. So he's interviewing people, and you know, the first fellow comes up and he's like, "Well, what can you do?" And he says, "Well, you know, I am great at fixing fences." Okay, I've got some fences that need some repair work. Second guy interviews, what, what do you do? Well, I can take care of the animals. I make sure that they're fed. I make sure they get enough water. So I'm real good at that. And uh, the third guy comes and he's like, what do you do? He says, well, I can fix barns. I make sure that, you know, the, the doors are right and, you know, it's not left open or slam and shut or whatever. And then the fourth guy who's named Pete, he comes along and he says, well, what, what can you do? And Pete says, well, I can sleep through a storm. So that was intriguing to him. He says, you can sleep through a storm. What what does that mean? So he was intrigued. He hired Pete. And, you know, a couple of days go by and he can't find him. You know, he's been a little, you know, sees him here and there a little bit, doesn't know where he's at. And lo and behold, this, you know, raging storm comes one evening. You know, and it's lightning and wind and thrashing and noise. And he can't find Pete anywhere. Pete's sleeping through this storm, right? But the reason that Pete is able to sleep through the storm is because he knows that he took care of all the fences. He made sure that the animals were taken care of. He, you know, made sure that the barn doors worked and everything. He knew that everything that needed to be done was done. You know, he wasn't putting things off to the last minute. And that to me is really, you know, that's the heart to me really of what a project manager should do, right? Is You've got to have everything, you know, just so you've got to have your contingency plans in place. You've got to have things that are done before they need to get done so that you can sleep through that storm because you know that storm is going to come. You just don't know what it's going to be, but it's good to have that in place. Yeah, I mean, I love that. And if we think about this stuff, right, it, these are things we all know, right? It's, yeah. it's kind of like your revelation during the chicken dinner. You, you knew that but you didn't probably subconsciously, right? Same thing being prepared. We know that it's um, how to lose weight. Everybody knows exercise and eat right, but we, we just don't do this, right? We, things that we put off or things that we don't take action on, why do we operate this way, right? How, how can we as humans know what's right to do, but then too frequently choose not to do that? It's a good question. You know what I mean? I think, I think there's a number of reasons why we have a tendency to act that way. Um, you know, especially in business, obviously, right. It's like, there's a feeling like you may not be adding value unless you're running around, you know, with our hair on fire, you and I clearly don't have that issue anymore. Right. (laughs) That's the hero syndrome, right? Let me, let me, (laughs) uh, let me not do my job. A fire starts and then I put it out. So I look like the hero. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's gratifying and it feels good. And, you know, you get that adrenaline rush, but it's exhausting and it's not sustainable. And that's just, that's just a you know, terrible way to operate. And that's terrible, especially then if you've got a team, right, that's following you. So that's, that's, that's one reason why I think that, that we could have a tendency to do it. Um, I think another reason is that we just have a tendency to put things off, just plain old procrastination. What's, um, you know, what's Parkinson's log? It's uh, that you work has a tendency to expand to fill the time that is available for its completion. You know, Oh man, we got three months to do whatever this is. We got plenty of time. So we're just going to put it off. And then next thing you know, that three months is just burned up. Right. Oh, yeah. And then you're rushing and then you're putting out the fire. Right. So there's another category. And then I think another reason is there is legitimate crises and there are legitimate opportunities that come up that require that level of firefighting intensity. But what makes that what makes that challenging then is if you've got, um, you know, 
emergencies that you're already dealing with that don't have to be emergencies, you can lose out on these opportunities and or being able to handle, you know, a crisis appropriately. So I just think it's just the way, you know, we just have a couple of ways that we're wired that, um, you know, we could have a tendency to put some of these things off. Yeah. And, I, and I'm guilty as charged, right? I mean, do I do the same things as well and uh, not, mostly not intentionally, but sometimes when I get my stuff done and you're doing it in advance and you have that moment to kind of sit back in the chair, right? And relax for a second, take a deep breath. How gratifying a feeling is that, right? When you're like, finally, I'm not behind, right? Because you if you're always pushing to the deadline, isn't I, me personally, right? I, I feel like I'm, I'm behind. I don't feel like I'm caught up. Uh, mm-hmm. And this project manager is, is, you know, you know, and I certainly know if, if you get to that point, it's probably too late, right? You're not going to be able to catch back up. That's right. And, and you know, I mean, and, and there's nothing wrong with getting something done, putting it on a shelf. And then, you know, and maybe later you may have to pull it off the shelf because maybe you have to reconfigure something or something has to be fine tuned, but that's way better than, you know, just the, the crisis at the last minute, right, to be able to do that. So I just think it's important to just, you know, to continue to just hold that discipline of getting those things done when you commit to them. It makes everybody's life a whole lot easier. Yeah, and, and what's great is I've seen you in action on this, right? You've had, you're one of the most prepared people uh, in the business environment that I've come across where, you know, I used to, after we had done the transition, I'm in another part of GPC helping them with another project and I kind of walk upstairs, see how you were doing. Yeah. Um, and you were always working on the next thing, right? You, you had, you were prepared before you needed to be prepared, which was great. Right. And that's certainly recognized, uh, at GPC. And, and that's why you've been pretty successful over there. Well, you just, you know, you know, the storm is always around the corner, whatever that may be, you know, it's just always going to be something. There's always going to be something. So what is it? It's the, you know, it's the known unknown, right? Right. That's what that falls in that category. And one thing, uh, you know, main topic we wanted to dig into today and talk about where this happens all the time, uh, procrastinations in places with performance reviews. Right. I mean, what do you see over there with or just not at GPC specifically? Right. But in your career related to performance reviews, I know I've got an opinion on this, but what do you think about this stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, it's just been, you know, I've, I've been in the project management space 25 plus years. So, you know, I've seen I've seen all types of things that work and things that don't work over the years. And, um, you know, it you may or may not have to do these these performance reviews as a project manager, you know, depending upon how your organization is set up. Um, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're a, a matrix organization, you may not be responsible for those directly. Um, but the functional manager would be, but it's the same principles that would even apply to us individually, right. As far as that annual performance review, but these annual performance reviews, you know, they fall into the category of not urgent and not important. Think about it, right. January one is here. And we got the whole year ahead of us to to do performance reviews, right? We're yeah. not we're not going to worry about it. It's not urgent, and it, it's it's important. It is important, but it's like it's going to just kind of fall down in that category, of not important. And we'll get around to it as the year progresses. So here we are now. It's December thirty first, you know. And even at this point in time, it may not be urgent. It's getting more important. <laughs> now the clock ticks, right? And now it's January first. Now it's urgent. Now it's important. Now you've potentially, you know, you've got this fire on your hand because now the year's cranking up, right? You know, everybody comes back from break. There's meetings, there's projects, there's deadlines, there's budgets, there's, you know, everybody's ready to go again, right? And then what we end up doing is saying, oh, you know what? Now you've got to cram in six or 10 or 12, you know, or more employees reviews for your direct reports. And you got to get those done in the, in the midst of everything else that's going on. So, you know, that clock is ticking. You get the relentless reminders from your HR system, you know, that just say this part is due or this step is due or these people are behind. And, you know, it just continues to just beat that drum. We prioritize things in our lives, right? And prioritization is a uh, urgency times importance, right? And as you mentioned, right, 
the performance review is important. Everybody has to do it every year. A lot of times merit increases are based on it. So importance is there. But priority is low because the urgency doesn't kick in yet. That's right. As, as we get closer to the deadline and all of a sudden you have to, as you said, knock out all these reviews. Now priority increases because the urgency increases. So importance times urgency at the beginning of the year, it's like a nine times one, it's a nine. Well, now yeah. priority at the uh, end of the cycle becomes nine times nine, right? 81. So it, it becomes a more uh, a high priority item. And, and this is a challenge that we face continuously uh, within the feedback loop, right? Within the, the process of giving employees feedback. Yeah, and it's like, and, and the, the problem there, so now now you've got a raging fire on your hands, right? So, so what happens now, right? This very important activity that can shape a person's career, their future um, opportunities, and even their pay, you know, is now relegated potentially to just another thing that you need to just check off your to-do list. It's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. That's your your team deserves better than that. You know, I mean, that is just not that's just not a fair uh, a fair way to to do performance reviews. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And um, in our purpose driven PMO uh, methodology that the PMO squad put out, we institute what we call debriefs, as opposed to lessons learned that people wait to the end of a project or a retrospective, uh, we do debriefs, which are, it's a opportunity for leaders and team members to come together at frequent intervals. We, we suggest weekly and put rank at the door and you start the debrief with, here's what I could have done better this week. Because far too often in a performance review setting or a lessons learned setting or a retrospective, we're asking, what could you have done better? And it it's always starts in a kind of a negative connotation to that. Like everyone becomes defensive. But in the debrief, it starts with, here's what I could do better. And with that, it creates a more open atmosphere where it's not about trying to point the finger or spotlight on somebody else brighter than you because they did worse than you, so you'll look better. This yeah. is an acknowledgement of the team to come together to build trust. So we advocate for... Uh, regular debriefs. And of course, the performance review is still important for organizational reasons. So do you find during those debriefs, are people, are they very forthcoming or, or what does that, what does that process look like? Are they like, yeah, I'm just going to spill my guts or are they a little bit reserved <laughs> in how they, how they do that? It takes a cycle or two for everybody to get used to it because they're cautious, right? That, it's new. That's not the way they've uh, interacted previously. Again, I didn't invent this, right? Uh, this is something I model after what the Blue Angels do, right? So we've all seen the Blue Angels are up there flying. They do practice runs. They do their performance. At the end of every run, they get together, leave rank at the door, and they say, um, uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Here's what I could have done better today during practice. Nice. And they go around the room, and they know after doing this for, you know, uh, decades now that they've been in existence, it's expected behavior, it's accepted behavior, and if you don't follow the rules, then others are going to call you out on that. So it's a matter of shifting the paradigm to right. a new set of rules. So at first, sure, people are cautious, yeah. uh, but after a couple of cycles, then you start building trust, and yeah. after you have trust, then you start making progress, and and we don't wait until a six-month window or a 12-month window to find out how to make that improvement. No, that's a great approach, you know, just coming with what I could have done better. Um, you know, that's just definitely a safer environment for sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, this is great discussion and it makes me think about the Oscars, of course. Uh, <laughs> so with, you know, the next logical question is what do performance reviews have to do with Oscars? Well, well, Joe, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> um, here's the deal. Certain movies, uh, there's this category, and it's just called it's called Oscar bait, right? So we we know what we know what clickbait is. You know, it's like it, you know, it's those headlines they try and get you to click on it, so you're going to go and see what you know is further down the road there, right? So there's a category of movies called Oscar bait, and what these movies are, you can look it up. It's on Wikipedia, so it's got to be it's got to be real. Got to right? be real. It's on Wikipedia. <laughs> so so these movies are released for the sole purpose of winning an Oscar. And one of the strategies that they use 
is that they will release the movie later in the year. So when that Oscar voting season begins, that movie's top of mind. may not be the best movie, um, but it's going to be what everybody remembers because that's what they saw. So they're not remembering back to February or March. They're remembering, you know, what was released October, November, December. And so we can fall as managers, we can fall victim to what I call performance review bait, you know, the same way. So yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying that your employees are, you know, saving up their best work for the end of the year. Well, you know, so that's all are. you remember. <laughs> the smart ones are. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's probably right. You know, but, but what we have a tendency to do is we're just going to remember what happened back the past two or three months. And so, you know, we're going to, we're going to scroll through our emails and we're going to scroll through our meetings and we're going to look at these, you know, different topics and we can just really remember maybe with some clarity the past quarter. And then we have no clue what happened at the beginning of the year. So now we've, we've turned this annual review into a, a quarterly review. Yeah. And, and what I find um, to make this even doubly more uh, challenging, if that's even a, a phrase to use, when we do performance reviews for project managers, it's based on the performance of the project. So if you have a project that's red, how is that going to impact a performance review for a project manager, right? He or she is actually doing their job when they're, the project is called out red because they're, yeah. they're managing the risk, the, the reward, right? They're, they're indicating with the status that it's red. But in their performance review, their boss is probably going to say, your projects are red. You're not doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. So not only do you remember the the most current quarter as opposed to the yearly thing, you were not even focusing on the right items. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's like, you know, you don't want to punish them for doing their job, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, and, and, and calling out those risks. So, you know, it's just, it's a slippery slope that you could go down. So how do we answer performance review bait, right? How do we solve the problem. I mean, it's obviously an issue. All companies deal with this. All managers have to deal with this. Employees get impacted by it. It's so prevalent. You know, you came up with uh, the performance review bait terminology. What's the solution? The solution is dig the well before you're thirsty. You know, that's another, that's just another project management ism that I really like, you know, and it kind of ties into sleeping through the storm, right? So, you know, the time to dig a well is not when you're dying of thirst and you're parched. You need to be doing it ahead of time, right? So the time to to be doing a performance review is not when you're, you know, kicking off the new year and you got all these pressures and stretches ahead of you, but it's to be doing it the entire year long. We all know this performance review storm is coming. It's not a surprise. This is a, this is a known known. Right. So we need to be ready for it and be writing that employee review all year long. Right. So makes sense, but I'm human. So my human nature is to uh, procrastinate and, mm-hmm. and wait for the end. So, mm-hmm. you know, this is, does this fall into one of those categories of, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I mean, what do you, what do you say to that manager? I mean, you've probably encountered some discussions about this. Yeah. I mean, as far as just putting it off, yeah. um, I mean, there's, I don't know. It's just like, I don't have time to do it you know, on a regular basis because I'm too busy doing other things that have a higher priority at that current time. So I'll just, I already know I get into my cycle, my yearly cycle, right? I do this every year. I'm used to it. Yeah. So, so yeah. how do we break that cycle other than just, you know, being able to sleep through the storm? That's right. Um, I just think we have to, what we have to do, is we have to change our mindset and be performance review conscious, right? All year long. And so that just means that we've got to put some kind of mechanism into our daily, weekly schedule and routine that just makes us think about the fact that is this something that could be or should be on a performance review? And breaking it down that way. And it's just a matter of then building it up over the entire year. So at the end of the year, you've got, you know, everything that you need. Um, and I'll tell you, I mean, it's like, think about, think about what's on any performance review, right? There's only three, there's really only three elements on any performance review. You're going to have a category. So it's going to be innovation. It's going to be communication, relationships, sales, results. 
whatever that category may be, whatever that company thinks is important to, to measure their employees on. Um, you're going to have some type of score. You're going to have, you know, a one to five, a one to 10. Um, and remind me to talk about that a little bit later, if you could, could remind me about that question. Because Well, as a great um, host, of course, I'll remind you, yes. Rating scale there, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then you're going to have examples, right? You know, positive or negative examples that back up that score. So those are the three elements on any performance review. So what, what I suggest is instead of write, writing just one massive macro review for 12 people all at once at the beginning of the year, why not shift that and just write these micro reviews for one person at a time all year long, right? And when I'm saying micro reviews, I'm saying it's the, you know, it's the spirit of catching people doing something right. Um, but then it's also, you know, focusing in on those areas where people can improve. So when you capture these little micro reviews all year long, and I'll tell you how that would work, you know, it's at the end of the year now. And when people are beginning to just start thinking about reviews, all you need to do is you're going to reflect back on all of this data that you've captured for the entire year. And your, your performance review has effectively written itself. Yeah, I mean, I love that. Uh, and it makes me think as well about what's the point of a performance review, right? I mean, the reality is it's not just an HR administrative task to figure out if we're going to give somebody a raise. It's to try to get people better, right? So that the collective is performing better and the organization can output better. And if we save all that up for the end of the year, if there was something we could have fixed in January, why do we wait to December? Right. If there's an improvement we could make in March, why do we wait to December? It's exactly and, right. and your approach is saying, let's address these things when they happen to have it be more real time so that the benefits both to the organization and the employee are, are real time. It, it, reality is it sounds like we're doing a disservice to the employee by holding everything back. We absolutely, we absolutely are, you know, and that's just, you know, that's just, that's just not fair to the employee. It's not fair to the company um, in order to do it that way. So that's why it just needs to be this annual, you know, do these micro reviews all year long. So how, what kind of, what's your process? How do you do that? Do you use a spreadsheet? I mean, what's, how do you knock that out? So I've got, a, I've, I start with a spreadsheet, right? So everything I do starts with a spreadsheet and then we'll, we'll morph into something else. But um, what the mechanism is for, for these reviews is it's the weekly one-on-one, right? You need to have, you know, you're talking about the debrief earlier, right? The yeah. weekly debrief. So, you know, you've got to, everybody should or does have this, this element of a weekly, you know, touch base, right? So let's just assume you set aside 30 minutes a week to meet with each direct. Now, what does that conversation consist of? You know, it, it, it consists of, projects, talking about projects or customers or goals or sales, feedback, family, you know, maybe some personal issues, you know, that type of thing that comes up in there, right? So that's just general conversation. And there's going to be a lot of transactional information that comes out of that, that is important for moving the business forward and moving projects forward. But what you're going to also find in there is that there's going to be, you know, some of these larger gems or accomplishments or themes that come out, right? You know, through that, it's like, oh, wow. You know, they were able to finish this and it was under budget and, you know, it had this impact earlier, whatever that was. Or it may be a theme where, you know, we may have heard some negative feedback and and there's, you know, maybe the second or third time uh, something that needs to be addressed, right? So these, these themes, they kind of, go into a different category and they need to be called out separately. All of that regular conversation that you're having every week, it just builds a solid relationship between you and the employee, but call out specifically this, uh, these, these items that you think would be a good to reflect on that performance review. What I love about this, right. Is we all run into this. If you're a new manager or an experienced manager, heck at some point we're all new, right? You don't have the tools. You, they're, you're like sitting there thinking that you're hearing the listeners out there today going, that's awesome. I, I'm new. I've got a couple of direct reports. I'm going to try this. Yeah. But how do I get that template? Back, right. I mean, you want to, is that template available for others? Are you going to share that with folks? 
Sure. I mean, you know, you will be able to contact me after the show and I'll be able to give them a, a sample of that template or give them the template itself that they can use in Excel. And it's pretty simple. I mean, it's, it's almost something that, that, you know, certainly anybody can make themselves. What you do is you just put in, you know, the columns are you get your name, get your employee name. You're going to have your category. That's where it's innovation, sales, results, whatever that is. You're going to have a column for plus slash minus, right? That's going to be, is this a pro or a con that that person was doing? And then you write a sentence that could be good enough to include on the review, right? So think about how this would work. Let's talk about this show. So, Uh-oh. I'm, yeah. uh, well, you'll, you'll, get a good, you'll get a good score. All this right. Is good. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. So, you know, if, if I were to fill out a line for you, Joe Puzz, employee name, you know, the category is communication, obviously. Um, you've got a plus, you've got a plus there. And then the sentence would be started an award-winning podcast that soared to the number one live project management show in the U S right. This is that capturing this little micro review that happens. I love so it. I think about this. Every single, every week, there might be one or two things that end up up on there. Um, and there might be, you know, there's going to be some negative things that end up on there as well. You know, some feedback that has been given. But as the year progresses, this this information just builds and builds and builds. And now at the end of the year, you run pivot table, which just saved my professional life, pivot tables. You run this pivot table and then you just break it down by, uh, by employee, category, pros. And then you've literally got the sentences that are written right there for the pros and the cons in your, your performance review has effectively written itself. And you go back the entire year. There's no surprises. You've had all these conversations with all of your employees. And there's, it just lends itself to just being a great, you know, great experience. As much of a great experience and performance review can be. Yeah, I, I mean, that's an awesome tool. And as you were talking, it got me thinking, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, some, a lot of organizations, the project manager specifically isn't responsible for the performance reviews of team members, but frequently, um, those, those managers reach out to the project manager and ask for input. So this tool isn't even have to be just for the manager, right? If you're a PM and you have a team of 10 and you know, the managers are going to come back and ask for info, you can use the same tool and knock that out in a second, because we all know you're not going to have, t- you're focused on your project, right? You don't have time to go back and think about this at, at review time. What a great what, tool for the PM too. What a gift that would be to the functional manager, right? Because you're right. You know, the project manager probably spends more time with that person than right. you know, the functional manager does, right? They're yeah. in a weekly meeting, you're seeing how they operate. And so what a gift that would be and what being a good corporate citizen that would be to be able to give that type of feedback to that functional, you know, that functional manager. And, and I, I want to be clear, I'm not saying it's like, oh, okay, well, you've written it and then you just copy and paste the whole thing and just jam it in. It's like, you, you're going to think through it. You're going to process it. You're going to put your, your whole spin on it at the end of the year. But you've got that raw data that just lends itself to feeding into just a really, you know, really good performance review. Well, another thing that, that makes me think of, you know, all the different tools we use in our daily life and again, guilty as charged, just like everybody else on this is, you know, if it comes in email, I create a folder in Outlook or whatever email I'm using, and it'll be performance reviews, Mark, performance reviews, Bill, performance reviews, Sue, right? And then I'll, I'll take that email from a, a situation and I'll save it over into that folder, right? So now I've got to go back into my Outlook to be able to find all these one-off emails I got during the course of the year. Yeah. Not as efficient as a spreadsheet, but it's what probably a lot of people are doing out there. Yeah, and here's the thing. Um, so the the spreadsheet is like the end results, right? So there's a process even within Outlook where you can take these emails that come in, you know, that flood of emails, and what you can do is you can save them as um, a task, right? Yeah. And then that task feeds into your weekly one-on-one agenda, right? Then there's a way, even within the task part, to set up this very template that I was talking about, you know, that you've got the plus and the minus, and you've got the comments, and you've got the category, and you can set all of that up in Excel. And um, then 
as those weekly one-on-ones go by, you've got your agenda to talk about for the week. Most of the stuff is just going to be deleted after that conversation. Some of that stuff will be moved over into that end of the year review. And then at the end of the year, there's the ability to export all that data out of Outlook, pull it into Excel, and then you end up with that report again. So, so again, I, I, I just love talking to people about this and, and showing people how to do this. And if anybody wants, you know, whether it's a, a, the template, you know, just as a starter to see how that would work in Excel, or you want to, you know, talk more about it and in, in, uh, how to do it in Outlook, you can, you can reach me on LinkedIn. That would probably be the best way to. You know, we all have something that gets us excited. So I'm, I'm great. Performance reviews works for you. That's uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's really pathetic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, but you know what gets me excited is those pivot tables, man. Yeah. I, love, I love pivot tables. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, you know, knowing you for a while, what gets you excited is is being able to sleep through the storm. Well, that's, that's right. It it isn't the performance review. It's knowing that you've I don't want to say perfected, but you've built a, an amazing system that's easy to replicate for others out there. That helps not just you, right? But it's helping your team members. I mean, it's an amazing process that you've got in place, and everybody benefits from that. Yeah, and, and here's the thing, even if you even if you don't have any directs, even if you don't have, you know, to you know, working with a functional manager or anything like that, do the same principle for yourself. I'll be honest with you, that's what I started. I was like, man, I gotta go through these performance reviews every single year, you know, over my entire career. And it's like, oh, what a drag. And I just started for myself is basically what I did. And then you get directs and then you get, you know, other relationships and you build out from there. But it just makes it so much easier and it just takes the fear out of it, you know, and the drudgery out of it. And turn into something that you know can at least be positive. You should write a book about this. I mean, you've you've got this locked down. I want to make an app. I want to do all kinds of stuff with this. You got to stop eating your chicken dinner. <sighs> Just hand me another biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as as we were talking about this topic uh, before the show, you had sent over some notes of stuff you wanted to talk about, and and uh, I got to reach over into my bag here. You had in there, you had said, Hey, you should check out this book, Radical Candor. Right. And I said, check out this book, Radical Candor. I already have it. I reached over on my desk because we were doing a zoom uh, prior to, and, and I already had the book. It's it's amazing. Right. And I I thought, and I thought that you got it because I recommended it. And you're like, no, I, you don't think I get books on my own. (laughs) So uh, that's a, a shout out to Chris Spear, actually, Chris, who's a, another, another former guest on the show. Uh, thank you so much. Chris had provided that book to me. Um, and uh, I actually have another book I'm reading that uh, Kim Wasson had sent over to me. So I'm in the middle of reading all these different books. Uh, but tell me about, or not tell me, but tell the audience about Radical Candor. Why is this a great book? So here's the deal. When you go through these performance reviews and you go through these weekly conversations and these one-on-ones, you are going to have to deliver maybe some not so good news, or there may be some things that that person is doing that needs to be improved or they're behind on. So you need to help them out in those areas, right? And so this book that I also have right here, Radical Candor, um, I wish I had read this book a long time ago. I don't think I knew that it existed. Um, but the, the whole premise of a good performance review is no surprises. So when the employee is, when you're done with the, the performance review, they need to just say, where do I sign? And this is exactly what I expected, right? And that includes the bad news, right? The, the employee should never be blindsided with any negative comments or things that they need to work on. And the first time they're hearing it is during the performance review. So this book there's a whole concept on it. I'm just going to paint the, I'm going to have to paint the picture of what this looks like, but it's, you know, it's your classic, you know, four square quadrant, right? Yeah. And you got the, the, the vertical line is how much you care about the person. The top is, you know, you got you really care about the person. The bottom of that line is you could just care less. Right. And then the horizontal line that crisscrosses that is how much you're going to challenge that person. So on the, on the right of it, you're going to challenge them directly and you're really going to you know, raise the bar. And on the other side, you just could care less, right? So that's broken into those four quadrants. So if you are down in the bottom left 
quadrant, which is where you don't care about that employee and you're not even going to say anything to them or help them or anything. The only time you're going to talk to them is if you need something. That's the manipulative insincerity quadrant. Bad place to be. Right? Yeah. The right side, the lower right side, is where you don't care about that employee, but you're still going to challenge them. You're still going to give them a hard time. You're still going to unreasonably raise the bar, and you're just going to just you know make their life as miserable as, as possible. That's that's the obnoxious aggression side of things. So it's not that, a good place to be. You can also save that box for your uh, acting out teenager at the current time. You may want to <laughs> use that that quadrant as well. Obnoxious aggression. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they get past it though. I, I can testify to that. So that's good. Then up in the top left quadrant, this is where you know you actually you care about your employee. And this I think most of us fall in this category, right? I mean, it's like it's it'd be hard pressed to say you don't care about who's working for you, right? But but the, the fault of this one is that you may not be brave enough or bold enough to say what needs to be said to help them out. And that's where, that's where over the years, I know I've fallen and that's ruinous empathy. Um, And I liken that to, you know, somebody's got spinach on their teeth. You know, it's like, you're, (laughs) you know, they got spinach on their teeth, you know, they're going to be talking to other people, but you're not going to tell them about it. Right. And they're going to just walk around and smiling and everything. And they got this big green nasty thing on their teeth. So that's that ruinous empathy. It's like, you think you're doing them a favor by not saying anything, but you're really not. Yeah. Because the reality is, is they're not going to work for you your, their entire career. They're going to go on to a different boss, a different company, different project. And if they take these bad habits with them, that's been a disservice to them as well. Which brings us to where the best place to be is where you care about that employee and you also challenge them, right? That's that radical candor. So it's it's a matter of, you know what? You're going to call out when they've done a great job, but you're also going to have the guts to call out when there's improvement that needs to be made. And that, that just opens the door again. That feeds into, think about the template again, right? That feeds into that performance review, right? You know, category, whatever that is, plus or minus, and you've got a very specific example that you've written in there. And you've had that conversation already, so no surprises. Yeah, I, I love, um, you know, another former guest of ours, Belinda Goodrich, has the book out, Be a Kick-Ass Project Manager translate that over to radical candor, right? The book on the front cover, they have be a kick-ass boss, right? I mean, how, uh, how to be human, right? Cause again, we're still dealing with people here, but man, when I've got spinach on my teeth, I want people to tell me, right? right. I, I don't want to walk around all day looking like an idiot. <laughs> right. And, and I, I do that often enough without the spinach, right? Why do I, why not tell people and do it in the, an appropriate way that's going to be constructive? And you know what's helped, you know what's helped, Joe, is I, I, I've met with my team and it's like, guys, this is the way I'm going to start operating. You know, I'm, I'm going to, this is what's motivating me is I'm not just coming at you, right? I'm not just, you know, gunning for you or anything like that, but this is, this is my motivation. And that just makes the conversation a lot easier to even start off, right? So that, that, that seems to work well. Right. I don't know. I think it works well. You, I don't, I don't, maybe you get some of the, the crew on another show. It may be different from their perspective, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, I think it's also uh, goes back to your question about the debrief and how well is it accepted? Well, it yeah. took a couple of cycles and then the debrief becomes the norm. Same way here. If, if you're using radical candor to do these reviews and be a good boss, it may take a couple of cycles for people to get used to that. And you hit on it earlier, right? It's it, the, the trust has to be established. It takes, you know, those two or three times and, and they have to know. It's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not, you know, this is not going to backfire on me or anything like that. But it is that trust that builds up over time. I want to go back to something you had talked uh, previously about uh, a review scale. And I promised that uh, I wouldn't forget. Um, so, You're a good let's, host. yeah, I'm a, I'm a good host. I'll remember that for you. Uh <laughs> So tell me about this. What What's the scale? So that's the other challenge, right, that we have as managers is that scale of one to five or one to 10, whatever that, you know, whatever that may be, right? So everybody wants to hit the max. You know, I'm a five on a scale of one to five. I'm a 10 on a scale of one to 10, you know, and that's commendable and we should feel that way. 
Um, but here's here's just the reality: is that we 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 are not all exceptional, and it's okay. But how can you articulate that, right? So let's say it's a scale of one to five. The way that I break it down is I say a one, a category of one falls in the category of an unknown stranger. A category of five is a game changer, right? So you've got unknown stranger to game changer, and a three is that you've done your job, and that's not bad, right? You've got to set that expectation that a three is perfectly fine. Um, I had a boss that I remember I, would, I went into him and I was, I, was bragging about, I was bragging about the job that I had done, right? I was like, yeah, I've got this, you know, I got this project schedule and I got this risk management, you know, matrix and I've got these contingency plans. And he was like, yeah, that's great. You did what you're getting paid to do. Right. I, was like, I was like, I was looking for like, oh man, that's awesome. Or wow, that's exceptional. It was like, you know, there's a certain element of you're, you're getting paid to do these things that you're doing. And that's a three and that's perfectly fine, right? So you're doing your job and three is not bad. But then the scale goes, if you go down toward that one scale, that's when, you know, nobody knows you, nobody knows what you do, nobody knows where you sit, nobody knows how long you work for the company. That's a, that's a bad place to be, right? So the flip side of that is a five, which is the other extreme. That's the game changer, right? So that's wherever, whatever it is that you've worked on, I always like to think that that's going to transcend whatever your group, whatever group that you're in there, right? So you may have a small team. Maybe you brought in some, you know, new technology or a new way or a new process. And it not only did it work for this team, but it transcended and went to another team or another department, right? And it's kind of gotten legs and it's gone from there. To me, that's the game changer side of things, right? So that just, that helps me articulate where, how, why, why there's a score of, you know, wherever it ends up on that, on that matrix or on that, on that gradient, right? Um, going from that, from that unknown stranger to the game changer and a three is not bad. Yeah. And I think it, it helps set expectations for everybody, right? As to where they are and, and where they want to go. Because I think the uh, challenge for anybody, right, is when you don't know, when there, when there isn't an expectation. And yeah. if you lay that out up front, then people get it, right? They understand. Absolutely. What I'm wondering, you know, people can't see here because they're not on the Zoom call here with us, but I can see. Um, and you're in Atlanta. And, and even if we didn't know you're in Atlanta, we could ask if you're from Atlanta because you've got in the background, a couple of Coca-Cola uh, vehicles, a flying vehicle and a road vehicle. What's that all about? So what that is about is my wife was just riding somewhere one day and just on the side of the road, there was a fellow that was making these and he had them like on the back of his truck and he was literally like just giving them away. You know, I mean, you give him a donation for them, but um, he was like giving them away. I think it was like a, you know, a max per two or something like that. And he was just crafting all of these different, you know, all these different uh, vehicles out of these Coke cans. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing what he did with it there. Yeah. So we got the plane and we got the, uh, got the car there. That's awesome. I love so that. I have, a, I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Am I allowed? Am I allowed? I, can I ask you a question? Of course. Okay. So I got your email yesterday, you know, PMO, PMO Joe happenings or what's, you know, what's going on. And one of the things was in there that you are uh, one of the top 15 semifinalists of the PMO influencer of the year. That's a big deal. Uh, Yeah. I mean, very humbling. Um, Something that was unexpected and um, Somebody out there nominated me for that. I don't know who it was. So thank you to whoever it was. They kept themselves to be anonymous. And I mean, if you look at that list of the 14 other people, I mean, there are amazing leaders in that group. So to be included in that is really an honor in itself. Next Thursday, they announce who who become the top three, who become the finalists. And then in September, they'll have the winner. So so Man. Is there anything, is there anything that your listeners can do to to move that forward, or what does that what does that selection process look like? How does that happen? 
You know, I don't think so. It, there's a uh, it's part of the PMO Global Awards where they help select the, the PMO of the year. And yesterday I did uh, some judging um, between Australia and the UAE, which was two great PMOs. Um, so part of that, they have professional awards as well. So within industry, they select uh, winners there. And then overall influencer is another category. So there's a judging panel in place uh, that goes through the different candidates. So I don't think there's anything the listeners can do. I mean, maybe you can uh, flood the global awards website uh, with emails or something. I don't know if that has any influence. Uh, maybe it's just answer survey, right? The global survey we have out there, letting um, letting that uh, uh, judging committee know that we're receiving input from around the world. As I mentioned, all the great countries that have responded already an individual leader. So the, I guess the, the more people that reply to that, uh, the more influence we have. So how, how do they, like, like you're saying you were judging these projects, like how, how do you judge the projects? Like what's the criteria or what are you, what are you looking at when you do that? So each PMO leader has to put together a video presentation that talks about different categories of their PMO. Uh, they talk to like the PMO journey they've gone through to get where they started to where they are today. Uh, what are best practices that they've incorporated? Um, how do they innovate? Uh, how do they build a community? Or so there's specific categories that we as judges have to use and the entrants have to provide their video presentation to talk to those points. And then as judges, we evaluate the different PMOs for what their video presentation looks like what they've presented. And then we ultimately have categories we score them on and we pick a winner and well, it's like March madness, right? It narrows down eventually to get to top PMO in Asia, top PMO in Africa, top PMO in South America, top PMO or the Americas and top PMO in Europe. And then they uh, get down to a winner last year, Brazil won. And uh, you know, we'll, in a couple more months, we'll see who wins this year. That's great. And then, Hey, you know, fingers crossed it would be an incredible honor uh, to get PMO Influencer of the Year. It's already an incredible honor just to be a semifinalist. Yeah. Um, so super excited. And again, I think that's a testament to this show and the guests we've had on the show to be considered. You know, we're, we've got guests coming up uh, from India and the UK and Canada. And uh, we've had, of course, from Australia and Honduras, and Spain, G Germany. I mean, we've had guests from all over the world we're trying to do that, right? We're trying to be an influence in the industry to give people a voice to be able to talk about their story. Because for every person who's telling a story, there's 100 people who are listening because they're actually walking the steps of that same story, right? They're just at a different point on their journey. Yeah, that's and, right. and that's why I love today's topic, right? Performance reviews, we all have that as leaders. And, you know, when you do your first one, you no one helps you, right? You're, you're kind of just out on an island. So to here are some of the input that you had, I think, is uh, is really going to be helpful for folks. But, you know, we've, uh, man, we've, time flies when you're talking performance reviews, right? We've hit that at the top of the I guess hour. That, man, that, this is really gets me going, man, I tell you. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, thank you. You had mentioned earlier, again, you've got your template. You've got how to do this and Outlook. How can people get in touch with you if they want to... Um, you know, continue this discussion or learn more about the templates. What's, what do you got anything coming up? What, how can they get in touch with you? you? You can just reach me through, um, through LinkedIn. That'll be the best way to do that. And I, I, uh, you know, I assume that the, um, you know, the contact information will be there even on your site there. And that'll be, that'll be great. Awesome. You can just reach out to me there. Yeah. Thank you, Chris, so much, uh, for joining us. It's been a great topic, a great discussion and super excited to have you. And of course, I want to thank all of our listeners, because without listeners, we don't exist. We wouldn't be the number one live radio show in America if we didn't have the listeners we have. Also, a reminder that we have a great list of guests coming up. Randy Englund coming up in August with John McCaskill. Uh, John McCaskill, fantastic story. He is a retired Navy SEAL um, who now has uh, work in his own podcast dealing with mindfulness. So please listen to that. I think it's going to be a great story. Cindy Dionisio, uh, who's one of the lead authors on PMBOK 7, that's coming out. So you certainly want to get that. Then Elizabeth Heron, Priya Patra, Pete Taylor, Ben Aston, 
uh, four consecutive international guests, uh, Jason Westland, Cornelius Fickner. We, you know, again, all-star lineup of folks coming up over the rest of the year. So we're super excited about that. And a reminder, of course, that the shows are recorded. Uh, so go out and subscribe to Project Management Office Hours podcast on Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, uh, all the right places you can get your podcast. And of course, thanks to our sponsor, the PMO Squad. Visit thepmosquad.com to learn more about the purpose-driven PMO and all our project management services. So that's it. Great show. We've got a new outro and we had a new intro and now we have a new outro. So let's listen to this one. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to another episode of Project Management Office Hours with PMO Joe. You're not alone in your project management journey. We're here to help you achieve your goals. Subscribe to Project Management Office Hours on your favorite podcast platform to catch all of our episodes and hear industry leaders share their story and secrets to success.